Good morning, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Lindsay Gillespie. It's good to see you all. It's a little different from uh, this point of view. But um, just a little bit about myself. My husband and I moved to this area about five years ago, um, and we've been coming to GVF for about four years now. Um, we have two little ones, Colin and Sophie. They're four and two. So since I have the microphone, I just want to say thank you to all of you who serve in our children's um, ministry. You guys are just amazing. You pour out your time and your love on these kids. So thank you. Um, I like to say when I share my testimony that it's my story of God's glory. Uh, I think that's one of the neat things about a testimony, that it's a real tangible way to see the power of Christ in someone's life. And I hope after today, we are just able to give God all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. So I was saved in January 2005, um, a little bit before my 24th birthday. I'll save you the math, I'm 37. And I remember when I was a new believer that I would meet people who had known Jesus for 10, 15, 20 years. And I was so envious. I mean, he is so great. And I had only just met him. I lived 20 some years of my life without him. And as I was preparing this, I thought, I was like, wow, that's me now. I have known and walked with Jesus for 13 years. It's incredible. And, you know, I'm not saying everything's been, you know, butterflies and sunshine and perfect, but it's been so sweet. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. So um, I was saved in 2005, and at the time I was living in the D.C., Virginia um, metro area. I had gone to Penn State, and I moved there for a job. And I can remember the date really easily and very specifically because um, it was right around the time of the March for Life. And at that time, I think it, the March for Life occurred like every third Monday. And so um, I was saved on a Sunday. The March for Life was on Monday. And I had had an abortion on Friday, two years or two days earlier. Uh, and it was, it was devastating. It was awful. Um, I knew immediately that I had killed my own child. I knew it. And I would just cry and cry and, um, you know, I didn't think that's what was going to happen. My literal, rational thought was, it's my constitutional right. How bad could it really be? And I learned the hard way of how bad it could really be. So I had friends who were staying with me and they left Saturday, um, and I was just crying, I couldn't sleep. And so I woke up early Sunday morning and I decided to go to church. And now looking back on it, I don't know what I thought would happen. I don't know why I even went to church. Um, my you know, family growing up, we did church, but then my parents got divorced when I was young. And so that kind of went away. We were sporadic attenders at best. So um, I guess though I'd always been, I always heard that church is the answer, the Bible's the answer. So I couldn't sleep and I went to church. And the only reason why I even knew this church was around was because there was an article in the paper about them. They just like built some new building or something. So I go to this church having never gone to church by myself. Um, and I sit there and the pastor comes out and prays for the offering and for the message. And then he prays for the March for Life. You know, we're in D.C. It's basically a, a local event for us there. So he prays for the March for Life. He prays for this country. He prays um, that, you know, we would realize abortion is wrong, that it's a killing. And I agreed with him 100%. I knew it. But then, then he prayed for everyone who had had an abortion. And he prayed that they could find hope and healing in Jesus, that God knew what you had done, and he knew how much it hurt, and that he loves you, and he forgives you. And I was shocked. I mean, it, it never even crossed my mind that I could be forgiven. 
I seriously was just trying to figure out how to live with myself, how to live with what I had done. The idea that I could have been forgiven and forgiven by God of all people, I mean, it was incredible. And, and so that was it. I was like, okay, I'm in. I, my salvation prayer was, I think, like, if what they're saying is true, I, I'm, I'm in. You have me. You know, it was probably the worst salvation prayer ever. But, you know, the words don't matter because God looks at the heart. He knows your heart. And I know, I know that at that moment, I had passed from death into life. I know it. I can't explain it, but I know it. And that I was a new creation. I had been forgiven. And I went home. I remember trying to read the Bible like a week earlier. You know, again, people said Bible was the answer. So I started reading Matthew. It could have been written in a different language. It meant nothing to me. I did not get it. I go home after that day and start reading the Bible. It was like the clearest thing I had ever read. It was just incredible. So, yes, I knew I was forgiven, without a doubt. But I still felt guilty. The guilt and the shame, and the best way to describe it is it's crushing. And, um, I mean, really my routine was pretty much, I woke up in the morning, I cried on my way to work, I pulled myself together for work, got back in the car, cried all the way home, and um, cried myself to sleep, and repeated that for probably months. Thankfully, um, when I, or the church I was going to, had a counseling center uh, connected with it. So I got in touch with a Christian counselor, and she was incredible. Um, she, or God, used her to walk me through 2 Corinthians 7.10, which talks about the difference between godly guilt and worldly guilt, and that worldly guilt wants to kill and destroy, keep you in that bondage. But godly guilt, godly guilt leads to repentance. God wants you to have freedom, to be alive. That is why Jesus died for you. And so she walked me through that. And for me, what that meant was I had repented of the abortion, but I had not repented completely, turning 180 degrees in the other direction of the whole sinful lifestyle that got me to that point. And I can say honestly now, I do not have the shame and the guilt associated with this anymore. God has freed me from that. I live with the fact that I killed my own child. That doesn't change. I've been forgiven, but that is still there. But God can redeem anything, right? I, I love that verse from Joel to talks about how God says, I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. Yes, Christ redeems your present. He does do that, and he redeems your future, but he also redeems your past. So a couple years later, um, God leads me to law school, and um, I thought, oh, this is what God wants me to do. He's going to use me to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, I don't think that anymore, but, but what it did was it gave me this perspective that I didn't have before, like another lens to see this issue through, because Roe v. Wade legally is a terrible decision. They literally created a right out of nowhere. And here's a quote from one of the law clerks who worked for the justice who wrote the opinion. He said, Roe v. Wade may be one of the most intellectually suspect constitutional decisions of the modern era. Even my law professors who were pleased with the outcome admitted that it's a horrible decision legally. So unlike most constitutional law, which I'm not going to belabor this point, can't really be overturned. Um, that's not the case with Roe. Roe is actually a terrible legal decision, and it could be overturned. And if, if the decision is overturned, that does not make abortion illegal. All it does is it takes it out of the Constitution and gives it back to the states. The states get to decide, you know, maybe some states will make it illegal, some will give it for free. I mean, it, but the biggest point from my perspective is that then we could have a real conversation about it. 
Because right now, the two sides, they're talking past each other. One says, it's a right. One says, it's a life. Like, you're not even talking on the same plane. So if we can get it out of the Constitution, then we can actually start having a real conversation about it. Because for me, from my perspective, I think the part of the conversation, the piece that gets left out completely, is what we are doing to our women. We are destroying our women. No one talks about it. My experience is not unique. You know, what I experienced is not unique, but no one talks about it. I would share with my college friends after I had my abortion, and all of a sudden people were, oh, I had one, my friend had one, my mom had one. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. Nobody talks about it. The best statistics I could find was that one in seven women have had an abortion. It's more likely the real number is one in four women. One in four women. Which means, if you think you don't know someone, you probably do. Just think about your friends, your mom, your sister, your daughter. Somebody you know has had one. And what it also means is that one in four women are walking around with the guilt and the shame and they're dealing with it as best they can. I mean, but for the grace of God, I, I really don't know where I would be. The only way I knew how to deal with things was either convince myself it didn't happen, and I was a really good liar, and I lied to myself the most. Um, I would either convince myself it didn't happen, or I convinced myself it didn't hurt. And if you can relate to trying to deal with stuff that way, you know that is not a recipe for success. The only healing, uh, forgiveness that we can be offered is through Jesus Christ. And it also means that one in four women mean that millions of women are walking around desperate to be forgiven. So during this same time, I was reading, um, and you know, everything was kind of happening at once. I don't really know which was coming first. Um, God was just really pursuing me. So uh, I was reading Corey Ten Boom's book, The Hiding Place, and if you're not familiar with her story, it's really fantastic. I highly recommend it. Um, it's a true story, and it's about her family. They were living in Holland during World War II and um, during the Nazi occupation, and they helped um, hide Jewish people from the Nazis so they could, they could escape. Um, so it really is, it's an incredible story. I actually was just reading it because uh, my dad had given it to me. I just was interested in World War II and like true stories. I had no idea that they were believers or that it was about God or Christ or anything. Um, but it really, it's an incredible, incredible story. And, um, and so I'm just going to share a little piece that really spoke to me about forgiveness. It's an amazing story of forgiveness. So um, she, or Corey and her family, they were helping the Jews um, escape, and they were really betrayed by somebody they were trying to help. So they get arrested and sent to a concentration camp. Her whole family dies um, in the concentration camps. And at the, um, at the end of the story, which is the part that I'm going to share, Corey um, really feels just a heart to be in ministry, share her story, and share the hope and love of Jesus Christ. So she travels all over, but she says this, that the place that hungered for her story the most was Germany. I mean, can you imagine, after everything she went through, she goes back to Germany. So she goes to Germany, and she's speaking at a church service. She sees one of the Nazi jailers from the concentration camp that she was in, and here's what she says. He came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming, and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Farline, to think that, as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who had preached so often to the people the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me forgive him. 
I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing. So again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And as I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our own forgiveness any more than on our own goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. And I, I remember reading that just thinking, I want that. How do you get that? And it truly only comes through the power of Jesus Christ. I, I did not even know what forgiveness was until I had been forgiven. And I try, Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive others as Christ has forgave you. And I try, I want to get to forgiveness so quickly. You know, my husband may not agree with me all the time, but I do try to get to forgiveness as quick as I can, not in my own power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, because God has forgiven me of everything. How could I not forgive someone else? And so I'm just going to you know, wrap this up. Um, you know, on that Sunday 13 years ago, I thought that prayer was just for me. I'm sure, you know, other people were blessed by it. But it felt like it was just for me. So if any part of my story connects with you in any way, don't waste the moment. Christ has already forgiven you. He did that way, way back on the cross. All he's asking you to do is turn to him and repent, and you will be forgiven.